any, anyone who's interested, um, we would like you to contact Sister Humphrey as soon as you do. This is Humphrey. I'm so far to
church to recognize that you are God supreme. As a church, we ask you, Lord God, to recognize that we have to build each other up. As a church, oh Lord, to recognize that if we do not laugh and talk with each other, you will not laugh and talk with us. So for that, oh Lord, we ask to give us strength, to forgive ourselves, and then forgive each other, so that we can be as a people building up for you and your army. Because, Father, a kingdom divided by itself can never stand. And for that, oh God, we are truly sorry because we are young and even we are old. The old ones are waxing older. And, Father, they are still going down to the same habits that they are when they were young. And that has not put us anywhere as a people. Because, oh Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. For the young ones, oh Lord, that are coming up and are stricken in their ways, oh Lord, we ask you, oh Lord, for clean hands. We do a right spirit within us that we may be able to be boldly representing your throne in this place we call it. Father, we ask you, O oh Lord, as a church, to wash us and cleanse us. So, Father, make us a people that are called by your name. So, Father, when we humble ourselves, O oh Lord, and humbly, we only take these things for granted, but humbling ourselves, O oh Lord, and coming before you, O oh Lord, and giving you thanks and praise, Father, will do great and mighty things which we do not even know. Father, we thank you, O oh Lord, for making us be able to worship in freeness, in, in a place that is safe, O oh Lord. We are truly thankful for it because, Father, we know that we are children of the Most High God. Father, so we thank you as a church that you will revive us and you, that all the things that are being orchestrated for us to come out to worship, that we will find time to be able to do it and not be busy for you. But Father, we ask you, O Lord, in all our areas of our lives, where we have to put our shoulder to the toy, we ask you, Lord, to help us because we cannot do it without you. Because, Father, if we do come to everything, Father, we know that things will be neglected. But, Father, we ask you for your wisdom, we ask you for your intervention, to work things around our lives and everything will be well and it will be well with our soul. So Father, we thank you, O Lord, as a people, come collectively rejoicing, and we ask you to feed us, O Lord, today, as Reverend is coming to spread your word. We ask the Holy Spirit to breathe upon us. We ask you, O Lord, to have, give us receptive mind and receptive body. Father, we ask you, O Lord, to be able to recognize you in the midst, and know that you are here, and here to bless. So Father, Feed us till we want no more. And at the end of the day, let us see at the end of the week that God is with us. And let us you know that He is with us. And not to say, God is with us and we know it not. Because we know each day is the blessing that is coming from you and coming from you alone. So as a church, oh God, we ask to strengthen the people called Methodists. Strengthen the people called Methodists in San Fernando, in the east, in the west, in the north, and in the south. Strengthen our people who are Methodists in the Americas, in England, in all over. Strengthen our church as different denominations, O oh Lord, because we are one body, we are one people, and we are one in Christ. So, Father, help us to have a united doctrine, knowing that you are God, and you alone are supreme, and you alone, O oh Lord, can heal, you alone can destroy, you alone can lift up, and you alone can put down. You are Lord, alone, mighty Jehovah. And we praise your name this morning by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we ask you to cover each and every Christian and all those who believe on you with the blood of Jesus Christ. So nothing shall offend us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Good morning. All is good? All is good. All is good. All the time. All the time. We come to worship this morning from different places. We come to worship this morning for different reasons. We experience the presence of the Spirit in different ways. We hear Jesus' words with different ears. 
ourselves.
you are the preserver, you are the sustainer. You are the beginning, Lord, and you are the end. You are the first and you are the last. You are a big and a mighty God. A God who can move into every situation. There are no situations within our lives this morning that cannot be healed. There are no problems, Lord, that cannot be solved by you. So we invite your presence here this morning, Lord, to search each and every one of our hearts. Because we know that you are searcher of hearts and reader of minds. So search us this morning, dear God, and see if there be any wicked ways in us and lead us in the way everlasting. Father, you have said in your word, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and you are just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This morning, Lord, I am asking you to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and create in us that clean heart and renew the right spirit within us. Cast us not away this morning, Lord, from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Father God, this morning I'm asking you to wash us Wash us in your precious blood. Wash us from the crown of our heads to the sole of our feet. Help us to know, Lord, that you are the God who have created us to worship you and to adore you and to praise you and to adore you this morning. Let us adore you. Let us come to you, Lord, just as I am without one plea. And that your blood was shed for us. And now the pillars come to thee, O Lamb of God. We come this morning. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, our riches gain, we count but loss and all content on all our pride. So, Lord, we demand this morning our life our soul, and all our body, we commit them all to you. And we give you all the praise this morning, and we give you all the glory. Not forgetting our superintendent, minister this morning, I ask a second anointing for him, that when those words and that message should come to us this day, there will be a transformation of our souls and a renewing of our minds. Lord, we need to be transformed. Lord, we need to be renewed. And we need this morning, this first day of March, yes, Lord, to accept you as our personal Savior and our best friend. These and all other mercies we ask in Jesus' name.
For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom we believe, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's home, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord.
All right. I like to be invited to lunch. I don't get invited enough. But I like it too. Because you are going to meet someone, you're going to eat by someone, and it's a nice little time. But I'm going to tell you a story about these two animal friends. One is a fox. You all know what a fox is, right? Right. One is a crane. Who knows what a crane is? Okay, I thought I would learn this, yes? All right, a crane is a bird. What kind of bird is a crane? Anybody has seen a picture? I was supposed to get a picture for you all, so forgive me. It's a, you saw it already? I've never seen one, actually, but good. What does it look like? What does a crane look like? It's white and, you know, boss on my face, it's what? It's white and yellow. What about its beak? What kind of thing about its beak? It's long, but it won't work. I have a shot on start from scratch today. Yes, it has a long, long beak. All right? So this fox and this crane are friends. And hey, you know the story? All right, OK. <laughs> Give 
your best. You want to do to others what you would want them to do to you. Would you want somebody to make you feel shame? Let me say, I don't want like somebody to shame them. Put your hand up. My God, no. <laughs> no, you would not. You would like to. No, 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 no. Anybody want somebody to make them feel really bad? So, would you do that to your friend? Should you do that in class to your friend and then laugh? Should you do that to some of you looking guilty? I look at that man up here. what you would not like to. You all know that? Michael, you have any words for me now? Yes. Any words for that? Okay, I can read the story, right? Who told you the story? You can't remember? Okay, all right, that person did have a job. Uh, so, let me, let me get some other ways before we finish about how you could be, you could do unto others what you want them to do unto you. Any examples? All right, let me get my girl here. Share your lunch. Share your lunch, that's the biggest one, yes. Share your snacks. Share your snacks. We're talking food, yes. Share your video games. Share your video games. I like that one. I'm coming by you. Anybody else? Be considerate. Be considerate. Okay, and? And kind. Please show them. Let me tell you. Tell me. Tell them one for me here, yes? Be nice. Be nice. Somewhere? All right, no, okay. Be cute. Be cute. <laughs> No, no, it's good. So that comes naturally. So if we had a world where people, would somebody want somebody to kill their child? So should somebody kill somebody else's child? So if we all live by that golden rule, it would be much better. Give your best to others. Give your best to Jesus. Give your, don't give what you mean in. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So let me see how many of you this week in school. You're going to do unto others. You're not going to push in the cafeteria line. Oh gosh, Jesse, like I call it, what's going on? You're not going to push in the cafeteria line. You're not going to take anybody's things. You're not going to do anything. You're going to take of the person. All right, so, okay, I'll let talk after. <laughs> you have to take of the person as if it is you. Take of the person, take of the person sitting next to your class as if it is you. What you will want to happen to you, you will want to happen to the person. How many of you are going to try that this week? I want to try to actually, yeah? Right, I have some friends who will be able to try to, right? I try my best, and I'm going to try for them. I'm going to think about them as my self. I'm going to think about them as my self. So I want you to know this week, okay, children? Um, Reverend Church, you want to? Thank you, children. Will save. For what will it come? 
wanted them to gain the whole world and perfect their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise be to Christ, O Lord. Fill us with the life of you that we may love the things that you love and do the things that you would have us do. As you breathe in us, we pray that you would empower us to be all that you have created us to be. Breathe in us so that we may hear and understand your word, internalize it and let it produce the fruits of the Spirit in us. Uphold me now, O God, that I may proclaim truth and nothing but the truth. And let your word now come unto us with power and precision. And let our hearts be blessed and our souls be redeemed. As we hear, we pray that you will give us understanding, that we may comprehend the truths of your kingdom, and so let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our strength and our salvation. Amen. In fact, while we hold Mark chapter 8, 31 to 38, the portion that was just read for us. Luke chapter 4 and verse 13. If you don't have a Bible, I'm sure there is one in the pew, in front of you or behind you. Luke 4, 13. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. When the devil had tempted him. Or when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. I'm sure that you know by now that God loves you and it is God's desire that you will spend eternity with Him in glory. I am sure that you know by now that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for your sins and made it possible for you to be reconciled to God. I'm also sure that you know by now that Jesus was raised from the dead, that he defeated Satan and sin. He defeated death and the tomb and rose in power and is now at the Father's right hand praying for you and for me. I'm sure that you know by now that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is coming again. And He's coming so that where He is, there you may be also. I am sure that you know that you are the apple of His eyes. And that God loves you with an eternal love. By virtue of all that I have just said, 
I'm sure you'd also recognize that you have an enemy. That there is someone who doesn't want you to experience any of the things that God has for you and wants for you. That because God loves you and wants for you to spend eternity with Him, I'm sure you have recognized from Scripture and from experience that there is an enemy who wants to destroy you. Who wants to ensure that you're not reconciled with God. Who wants to ensure that instead of you spending eternity with God in heaven, that you spend eternity with Him in hell. And this is what the in-between time is all about. About God saving you. And about the devil trying to take everything that God has blessed you with. The devil trying to render you null and void. Incompetent. The devil trying to ensure that when judgment day comes, that you hear God say, depart from me. I know you not. And how he does this? Through his schemes, his trickery, and his temptations. Even Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had to face Satan. Had to face the forces of evil. Even Jesus was confronted with the enemy and with temptation. And so just before his crucifixion, Jesus called Peter and said to Peter, Peter, the devil has demanded, demanded, not the strong word, the devil has demanded to save all of you like me. The devil has demanded to destroy your life. The devil has demanded to bring every test and every temptation in your life to ensure that you are destroyed. Then Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. And therefore I am saying to you, my brothers and sisters, that the same demand has been made for your life, to destroy you. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. The devil is opportunistic. He seizes every opportunity to destroy your life. And he left him until an opportune time. I want to talk to you today about those opportune times that the devil seizes and uses to confront us and to destroy us. He first sought to destroy Jesus. And after Jesus was able to overcome every test, every temptation, when the devil realized that he could not have gotten Jesus at that particular time, he did not give up. He simply left him until an opportune time. Let's talk about those opportune times. First of all, such opportune time is after a spiritual victory. Let's go back to Jesus' own experience. We're told about John the Baptist who was preaching and teaching and baptizing people. And one day Jesus showed up to be baptized by John the Baptist. And John said to Jesus, no, I'm not going to do that because you're greater than I am. I should be asking you to baptize me. Jesus said, let it be so for now. After Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, 
We are told that the heavens opened and a dove descended on him. The dove representing the Spirit of God. The dove representing Jesus' anointing for ministry. And then there was a voice from heaven that said, This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. This was indeed a very high point for Jesus. Because maybe for the past 30 years, Jesus sought to understand himself and sought to understand his ministry. And now Jesus came to a point where the heavens opened and he experienced an anointing from God. A dove descended on him, a dove rested on him, which is to suggest that God was with him. That God was anointing him. And then God clarified what had happened when the dove rested on him. God himself said, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. In other words, God was saying to Jesus, I am pleased with you up to this point. I am pleased with the life that you have lived. I am pleased with your knowledge, with your understanding of yourself. I am pleased with you accepting the mission, the ministry to which I have called you. I am pleased with you. This is something similar to what God said of David when the word of God says that God from David, son of Jesse, to be a man of his own heart who would do everything that he wanted him to do. And here God was affirming to Jesus that I am pleased with your life. I am well pleased with you. I am pleased with the path that you have taken. I am pleased with the plans that you have. I am pleased with you wanting to honor me in all things. I am pleased with you. And just after that whole scene, the next step takes him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. It's amazing. Jesus has just come face to face with God. And the next step he takes, he comes face to face with the devil. No wonder the psalmist says, as surely as the Lord lives, uh, there is only one step between me and death. Jesus has just received affirmation from heaven that God is pleased. He is on a mountaintop. He is on a roll. And just as he takes the other step, he is plunged into a wilderness. He is plunged into a time of testing. He is plunged into a time of hardship. He is plunged into a time of difficulty. He is plunged into a period of darkness. And so such opportune time is just after a spiritual victory. And therefore I'm saying to you that because the enemy wants to destroy your life that you got to watch it just after a spiritual victory. you got to watch it just after a breakthrough. you got to watch it just after you have received the answer to a prayer that you have prayed for years, a desire that you have had and that God delivers, God meets that need. So the next step is going to bring you face to face with Satan. Just after your struggle with an illness and you're being healed and delivered, your next step is going to bring you face to face with the devil. Just after you have experienced a financial breakthrough and you know that it is God fulfilling his word when he says I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory, the next step is going to bring you face to face with Satan. Just after spiritual victory. Just after you have come to the place of wrestling and surrendering your life to Jesus. Just after a worship experience where you know that your spirit has been lifted. And you know that God is in your heart. And you know for sure that you are a child of God. The next step is going to bring you face to face with the enemy. How many times you have had... A spiritual victory. 
How many times you have come to a place like this and you have worshipped God and you know for sure that God was in the place, that God was in your heart, that God has spoken, that God has shown himself to you and as soon as you leave, you come into a confrontation with someone. As soon as you get back home, it's a quarrel, an argument. As soon as you get into the office the next morning, after you've sung all the way to, to work, you've sung his praises, and you felt his presence in that place, and you felt, now I can take on the day. And as soon as you walk into the office, the devil waits for you, sometimes through your boss or co worker. The word of God, therefore, is saying to us, watch it. Just after spiritual victory. Do not become complacent. You realize the devil doesn't give you much time to celebrate? You don't have much time to celebrate. That is why the, the battle is never over. That as soon as you've gone the victory, you've got to keep pressing on. Because you know, the reality is that as soon as we have gotten a victory, we tend to sit back a bit and relax a bit. Uh, and that's when the enemy is ready to pounce on us. Uh, and therefore, when you experience one victory, begin to look for the next victory. Begin to press further in. Begin to to, to, deep, to, to come closer to God. Begin to rely more on the strength and the power of God. Because just after spiritual victory, there's a pitfall. And he left him until an opportune time. And such opportune time is just after a victory. Secondly, the next opportune time is when you're alone. The Bible tells us that Jesus was led out into the wilderness. Alone. He was alone with the devil. There was no Peter there to say, yes, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. There was no Mary there to say, this is my son. There was no Anna or Simeon there to sing praises and to say, this is the child of the promise. There were no disciples there to surround him. Jesus was virtually alone. You know it was at such a time that you give thanks to God even for your enemies. Because not even the Pharisees were there to make his life a living hell. Not the Pharisees were not there to try to chop him. The Sadducees were not there to try to, to stir up trouble. He was alone, neither friends nor foe. He was alone with the enemy. The enemy uses those times when we are alone. It is an opportune time for him. Hear me carefully. God created us for community. We were not made to be alone. And I'm not talking here about marriage. I'm talking about living as part of community. I'm talking about being a part of community, whether it be the church community, the home community, the workplace community, we were never created to be alone. And there are some persons who have this attitude of aloneness. They are low rangers. They love to work alone. They love to do stuff alone. They like to be alone. And I'm saying to you that when you do that, you are creating an opportunity for you to be attacked by the enemy because he wants you alone because he knows that when you are alone, that you have no backup. When you are alone, you have no one to watch your back. When you are alone, you have no one to warn you. When you are alone, you have no one to encourage you. When you are alone, you have no one to strengthen you. That's when you are alone. And the reality is that we are accountable. We are accountable to each other and for each other. We are accountable in relationships. We are accountable. It is no wonder, look at the first sin. The first sin was because of a particular individual who decided that I prefer to be alone. Because when Cain killed his brother and the Lord asked him, where is your brother? Here is his response, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, he was saying, don't you realize that I'm just good alone? Don't you realize that I don't care much about my brother? Don't you realize that I don't keep company with my brother? Don't you realize that I'm a lone ranger? Don't you realize that I work alone, I sleep alone, I eat alone, that I'm alone? Am I my brother's keeper? I mean, I'm responsible. 
ansiyeshiwa and the reality is that we can be in the midst of a crowd and still be alone And so some of us come to church and we come to this place where we really want to have nothing to do with anybody here. Come to church, serve my God, worship my God, sit down, hear the benediction, leave, you talk to me, you call me, you ask me anything, I just come to worship. May I say to you, that is a dangerous place to be. I don't want to know anybody's name. I don't want anybody to know my name. I don't want to know where you live. I don't want anybody to know where I live. I am just here to worship the Lord. But the Lord would say to you, it's a dangerous place to be because you are providing an opportunity, a perfect opportunity to be tempted and tested by the devil. We are accountable for one another. We are accountable to each other. And so when we go through situations, some of us go through situations alone. Some of us go through our pain and our hardship alone. Oh yes, I know there are some people who talk too much. And I'm not suggesting that you tell your business to everybody, but I'm saying there has to be someone that you can confide in. There can be someone that you can have as a support. There can be someone in your corner with you. I'm saying to you, don't go through life alone. Not only is it a lonely experience, but it is also an opportunity for the enemy. Jesus was alone. And he used that as an opportunity to strip him bare. He used that as an opportunity to try to mess with his mind. You know, someone was saying just this morning at Kelshaw, and someone who is the daughter of a Methodist minister knows church and knows about church. Someone who has encouraged many persons throughout the years. And she lived alone and she says that she got sick and the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong and they therefore couldn't, didn't know how to treat her because they didn't know what to treat her for. for. And while she was there alone, she was actually preparing for death. And she called her son and said, look, you have to take over here. You've got to be the person to hold the family together. I'm not going to make it. And she said, the devil started to mess with her mind. And the devil started saying to her, what this heaven thing that you're talking about? There's no heaven. So God, death, that's the end of it. There is nothing after that. There's nothing, absolutely nothing after that. Fortunately for her, her son decided that she he was going to take her to live with them, with his family, until she got better. And it was while in the company of her son and his family that she began to reassure herself that her faith in God is authentic. That indeed there is a heaven. And she began to rebuke the devil. She began, she began to send the devil away. And she said, gradually and more and more, Faith began to be restored and she began, began to believe again and believe God and believe God's promises. And I'm saying to you the devil can begin to mess with your mind when he thinks you're alone, when he thinks that you have nobody and nobody watching your back and nobody interceding for you and nobody praying for you. When he thinks that you're alone, it's an opportunity. When he knows that there are people on their knees who are praying School. But you know who are? My sisters. Boy, they used to fight every battle for me. And I've seen them beat up some guys who are much bigger than me who were trying to pick on me. And then people began to realize that, you see him? Let's be careful because he has some people who 
We don't want to get them on the wrong side. But then I realize that the enemy does his worst with us when he thinks we have nobody. And especially when we want to convince ourselves that we have nobody, is we alone. It is like Elijah, look what he did to Elijah, when Elijah who had just had a tremendous victory on Mount Carmel, heard the Jesus and said, I'm going to do to you what you did to them. Elijah started to run. When God met up with him and asked, Elijah, what are you doing here? Hey, Elijah, it's me alone. They have killed your prophets, they have broken down your altars, and I am the only one left, and now they are trying to take my life. God says, Elijah, stop it. There are 6,000 prophets who have not gone in these to be on. 600 of them. And so you are not alone. And that's why the devil is messing with him. That's why the devil is messing with him. Because he thought that he was alone. Let me go on to the third one very quickly. And we're still talking about opportune time. And the third opportune time is when you are physically drained. When you are physically drained. Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness, a barren wasteland that would evaporate the strength of anyone, leaving them weak and vulnerable to be attacked. But Jesus was not just in the wilderness, he also fasted for that entire period. Lack of food and sleep, sickness, mental stress, hard work, any of these things can bring on fatigue. And when we find ourselves sick and tired of being sick and tired, you know, there are persons who are always tired. I'm one of them. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> and in preparing for this, I realized that, hey, and I had to speak to myself and say, hey, what a dangerous place, you know. And the truth is that we live in a world that will make sure that we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And for some of us, the devil will find very good work for us to be engaged in so that we be tired. I mean, good stuff, you know, things that need to be done, things that certainly will glorify God. But the truth is that while they need to be done, you're not the only one. And therefore, you don't have to do everything. And if you die, this stuff will still be there and it'll get done. And the devil wants you at a place where you are drained. He wants you at a place where you are tired and frustrated. He wants you at a place where every time you try to pray, you fall asleep on yourself. Why am I talking to anyone? That every time you try to read scripture, you read the same page about 20 times and still try to make sense of what you have just read. Why am I talking to anyone? <laughs> That's where he wants you. That every time you sit to have a, a special time with your family, you are the first to fall asleep. But every time you decide to call that person that you've been trying to get in touch with, you realize that you're talking, but you're not sure who you're talking to or what you're saying. He wants you there because he knows that when you are there, it is an opportune time for testing. An opportune time to start messing with your mind. An opportune time to start messing with your life. He wants you where you are tired. So I realize that for your own sanity and for your own spiritual well-being, sometimes you just have to say no. And I have learned that no is an answer. It may not be the answer that people want to hear, but it's an answer. And when you say no, you ought not to make an apology for saying no. Just have a difficulty saying no, and by the time you start making your apologies, you find a way to get them to say yes. No is an answer. You, didn't, you don't need to clarify it. 
You don't need to justify it. You don't need to give an explanation for it. You don't need to apologize for saying no. No is an answer. Because when you are tired, it can lead to sickness. And when you are sick, the devil can begin again to mess with your mind. Look at you. You're doing all of that for God and still you're sick. And I've heard people even use that. People begin to mock you that. You, you, you pretend that you are this and, and you are that. You are a preacher and yet you are sick. You are telling people about God and about healing and yet you are sick. You are going through all of that and you are always in church and your home mash up. But what's going on? And it begins to mess with your mind. You know, I've known of many preachers who have the gift of healing. Who have lived with sickness all their life. I can think of Brother Wortman. He was sick for the better part of his life when he had a ministry of healing. And I'm sure somebody would have said to him, Heal or heal yourself. And that may have messed with his mind for, for some time well. And so the devil wants us at a place where we are sick, where we are vulnerable, where we are tired. So that he can begin to mess with us. You see? He messes with us. But we have to remember the word of God tells us that we live by the spirit and not by the flesh. Sometimes the flesh is weak. And Jesus himself said that. But the spirit is weak. Fourthly, are you counting with me? Yes. The fourth one, and you'll be surprised by this one when you're in church. <laughs> when you're in church, it's a perfect opportunity to be tested and tempted by the devil. If you look again at the temptations of Jesus, the devil took him to church. The devil took him to the highest pinnacle of the temple and there tempted him. The devil took him to the Holy of Holies. The devil took him to the place of worship. The devil took him to the place of rejoicing and thanksgiving in the Lord. But let me tell you why. You see, when we go to worship, our hearts are open to the Lord. We come to church, most of us, with our hearts open, with expectations. We come expecting God to show up. We come expecting God to bless us. We come expecting God to pour out in us. We come expecting that God will touch that part of our hearts that are aching and yearning a touch from the Savior. And so when we begin to sing, and when we begin to worship, and when we begin to listen to scripture being read and, and the testimonies given, and we begin to sing, and, and the drums begin to roll, and the, 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 the organist begins to, to play, and we get excited, we get caught up in that, and the music is really sweet, and the, the, the music is really, it's captivating, we are in an ecstasy, and we are truly in the worship experience, and then gradually, 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 our focus moves from God, are you with me, church? To the music, to the ecstasy, to the singing, to the excitement. Gradually, our hearts are still open to the Lord. Our hearts are still open to the Lord, but our, our focus, our attention moves from the worship of God. Our attention moves from God to the other stuff around us. And when our hearts are still open, but our focus is no longer on God, it's an opportunity for the devil to enter. What did he write? He says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full. Can you say that again? Look full. Not halfway. Not pathway. Look full in his wonderful face. 
face, and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let me tell you what happens. Because when you're worshiping, and your hearts are open, and your focus turn away from God to the music and to the singing, then you begin to notice that the drummer missed a particular beat or the organist missed one or two beats and the focus is no longer on God but he just messed up the song that I was enjoying so much and the praise team, team is really off key today. A focus from God to the freaking voices. Are you with me? Our focus turns even further away from God and we start noticing the person in front of us and it seems as though she didn't get much time to do her hairstyle because this is not in place and that is not in place and look at that dress, look at that outfit, look at that tie, it's not probably tied and we begin to notice stuff. Notice what's going on there? Our focus turns away from God. And the devil begins to make us preoccupied with other things. Our focus turns away from God and we begin to think about the kalaloo that's not cooked yet. <laughs> and we begin to think about the stuff that we have to do to prepare for work tomorrow. And we get, begin to think about the assignment that's not yet finished. And we begin to think about that person in the office who I don't like. That, and I hear that word and that's from her and that's not from me. So when I get to work tomorrow, I'm going to sing at the top of my voice so that she will understand that she is the devil that the preacher talked about. Notice what he's doing. Notice what he's doing. Right in church. Right in church. And you begin to plant mischief in your heart. Right in church. You begin to think about what you're going to say to your spouse when you get home. Right in church. That's going to aggravate him. Aggravate her. Right in church. And right in church. You begin to think about what you're going to say to the, to the boss and what you're not going to say. I'm not going to work tomorrow. Right in church. When our focus should have been on God. The devil makes sure he provides other things to occupy our time because our hearts are open. And once our hearts are open, we must receive. And if we are not receiving to God because the channel has been plugged up, we will receive from him. Mm -hmm. Are you there still? Right in church. Perfect opportunity. Perfect opportunity. I'm going to finish soon. You know how else he enters in church? When we come to church, we're ready to defend truth. We're ready to defend truth. And we find ourselves thinking we're defending truth. But in essence, we're defending tradition. You know, last week I went to another church and I decided that we're going to read the gospel and I asked persons, just to remain seated, we're going to read the gospel. And some person started, this is a new thing? You know what's going on here? Uh, is he serious? And you can see that some person is really uncomfortable because they're sitting for the gospel. And right there, they're defending what they call truth that is really tradition. How many of we bless God for the traditions that shows our respect for the gospel, for the words of Jesus himself? But it is tradition. It is tradition. And some persons begin to say, but that's not Methodist and this is not Methodist. As though um, we are breaking some rule that God has set. And we become defenders of tradition, thinking that we are defenders of truth. And the devil loves that. The devil loves when you begin to quarrel about what the preacher did and what the preacher didn't do and what the preacher said and what the preacher didn't say. You know, I preached at a church some time ago and another preacher who had a doctorate in something, local preacher, came to me and said, Brother, interesting perspective, but if I was to preach that, I would have said this and I would have said that. I said, Brother, God bless you that you were not the preacher today. So, <laughs> so you get to say it. When that time comes, 
Then he was, and I, I'm trying now to, that when I go to church, I just go to worship. And not to evaluate the worship and not to criticize. I just go to be blessed. We see some of us preachers can't do that. We don't ever take off that preacher hat where we don't evaluate the service and we don't look at the length and we don't look at the hymns and the choice of hymns and we don't look at what the preacher said and what the preacher didn't say and that sort of thing. Some of us have a difficulty doing that. And God teaching me that when I go, just go to worship. And let him be God. Right in church, eh? The final. Well, two more. When we begin something new, that's the other time. You see, Jesus was just beginning his ministry. And I'm sure some persons begin to think that he's going a little too long now. That may not be the devil, it's true. <laughs> Jesus was just beginning his ministry. And whenever you begin something new for God, it's a perfect opportunity. The devil knew that Jesus' ministry will mean healing for the sick. He knew that Jesus' ministry will mean deliverance for the demon possessed. He knew that Jesus' ministry will mean that Bartimaeus who was blind would see again. He knew that his ministry, that Jesus' ministry meant that Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of his life. He knew that, uh, that the man who had a legion will be delivered and the devils were going to pick and the drum in the ocean. The devil knew that. The devil knew that Lazarus would become a good friend of Jesus, that Lazarus would die a premature death, and Jesus will raise him back to new life. The devil knew that Jesus' ministry meant that his own ministry was going to be besieged, that, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. He knew that Jesus' ministry meant that Jesus is stronger than sin and Satan to Jesus must bow and so before Jesus gets to start his ministry the devil says I'm going to destroy him I'm going to destroy him before he even gets to start in other words the devil says assess the sin see this man this man is trouble this man is going to create trouble this man is going to cause me to work overtime to keep what is mine <laughs> So before he gets to start, let me finish him. And I'm talking to persons because maybe I'm talking to persons and you know that God has called you to a particular area of ministry. You know that God has blessed you with gifts and graces for particular areas of service. And you've tried to start, but all dead or hell broke loose. People who you thought were your friends turned against you. People started to speak negatively about the stuff that God has been doing in you. The criticisms were not helpful. They want to destroy you. Maybe I'm talking to you and you are not involved anymore because the pressure was too much. The going gets got tough uh, and you decide to jump ship. I am saying to you that the devil knew that have you continued, have you persisted, have you um, recommitted yourself to Jesus that you would have given him a run for his life and so before you get to start he crippled you early. Tell you how misfit you are and how you're in the wrong place and what you're playing and what you're pretending to be because he knows your worth. The devil knew Jesus' worth. And so at the very beginning of his ministry, the devil attacked. The final one is when you're most confident. Let's go back to the passage on Mark where Jesus had just declared to Peter because Jesus asked, who do they say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, look, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my father in heaven. I am sure Peter, and then Jesus says, I am going to give you a long, you're no longer Peter, and you're no longer Simon, sorry, you're Peter, the rock. You're the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the 
gates of hell shall not prevail. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of God. I'm sure that Peter, Peter this time is going to dress differently. You know, I once heard about a, a, a minister of ours who the, the superintendent was going overseas for some time and asked him to well, watch the circuit for him for, for the week. Every day that minister went into the office in jacket and tie. Started to dress differently. Started to give orders and command. I'm sure this is where Peter was. Uh, that Jesus said, I'm giving you the keys. Remember, the disciples were arguing about who was going to be the greatest. Uh, and now Jesus says, I'm going to give you, you Peter, I'm going to give you the keys. And so no, no, there's no doubt that Peter was dressing differently. He was behaving differently. He felt important. He felt that he was the successor. That Jesus, I am going to run this kingdom. I'm going to run it well. I'm going to decide who gets in. I'm going to decide who stays out. Peter was feeling good about himself. So now Jesus says, look, I must go to Jerusalem. And I will be handed over to the chief priest, the scribe. I'm going to be crucified. Peter takes him aside and says, my Lord, that must never happen to you. And Jesus turned to all of them and says, get behind me, Satan. The rock became the stumbling block. The rock became the stumbling block. Isn't that so true sometimes? Persons of being the rock in their family became the very reason that the family disintegrates, became the stumbling block. Persons of being the rock in the church or being involved in ministries and involved in service uh, later became the stumbling block because they began to say, this is mine, I did it, I started it and I'm not handing it over to anybody. And so the rock becomes a stumbling block. And the devil loves when we're at that point where we're confident in our house. And that is why Paul says, I will never boast in myself. Even though I can. Even though I have reasons to boast, I will never boast in myself. But rather, I will boast in my suffering. Rather, I will boast in the Lord. Because I am what I am because of the grace of God. I'm saying to you, be careful lest you become to puff them. Be careful lest pride fill your hearts and you begin to think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Be careful lest you think that you are the beginning and the end. Lest you think that you are the maker and the breaker. Be careful lest you become too confident in you. This is an opportune time for the enemy. So can I say to you, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of the earth to do strangely thing in the light of his glory and his grace. Amen. Let us just maybe you have fallen for one or two of them already. Maybe you know them all so well. And maybe I'm talking to you and you're in the middle of a testing. Tremendous testing. Yet maybe there are others who are just going in. Still maybe I'm talking to others who are on their way out. But whichever point you are, whether you're not going into your time of testing, you're in the middle of it or you're coming out, I want to say to you, that God is able. And Jesus is a friend of sinners.
glorify your name, Lord Jesus, because you're a friend of us all. And oh, Lord God, we bless you because there is a friend in Jesus with all our sorrow share, a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And we bless you, Lord God, that you are our friend. Oh, that we can say, I am a friend of God. What a joy. What a peace. What a hope. What a fellowship that you are our friend. And so, Lord God, we single out the persons who are struggling today. We single out the persons who are going through times of test temptation and testing. Oh God, we remember before you those who are going through extreme difficulties and hardship. Oh Lord God, we pray for those who are being tested and their faith. Now straining to remain firm. Those of God who do not know how to cry out. Those of God who do not know where to begin to cry out. Those of God who do not know what is the next step to take. Oh Lord God, I pray that in the name of Jesus. You'd reveal yourself to them today and you'd show them the way. That you'd show them the path. That you'd show them the plan for their lives. Oh God, there are persons whose hearts are heavy. God, there are persons who do not even know if they want to live anymore because of what they're going through. I pray, God, that in this very moment you speak to them. It's only you alone can. That, oh God, you will speak a prophetic word that they will know that it is from the Lord. That, oh God, you speak a word of hope. That they will begin to sing things are getting better. Getting better for me because God sees your pain and knows your heart. God, I pray that you reveal this word to them that weeping will endure for a night. The joy comes in the morning. May they know that Satan has no power except that which they have given to him. Because Jesus is stronger than Satan and sin. Satan to Jesus must bow. Help them now, God, to speak to the devils in their lives and say, Get behind me, Satan. Help them now, God, to speak to the devils around them and the devils within them, the devils that are seeking to derail them from your plan for their lives. Teach them, oh God, how to speak to the devil as Jesus himself did. Satan, get behind me. For you are a stumbling block. Move, Satan, move. Let me pass. And so, God, I commend them to you and to your Father in care. In Jesus' name.
up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise the Lord. It is right and a good and pleasant thing, joyful and solitary, always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise, Lord God, ever living, ever blessed, almighty, all and loving. Through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. You created all things and you made us in your image. And when we had fallen into sin, you gave him to be our Savior. He shared our human nature and lived a fully human life. He suffered rejection and condemnation and died on the cross. You raised him up from the dead and you exalted him to the glory of your right hand, where he reigns forever as priest and king and makes intercession for us. In witness of his glory and honor, you poured out the Holy Spirit, building up many people into one body, making us living members of your holy church, and enabling us to stand before you to sing your praises and to celebrate your mighty acts. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we join in the hymn of everlasting praise. Holy, 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 Lord our host, heaven and earth are full of glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread into his holy hands and looking up to heaven, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Therefore, Father, in obedience to his command, we do this in remembrance of him. Pray that you will accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we who receive your gifts of bread and wine, we share in the body and blood of Christ, and become united with him. And as, and as we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, we pray that you will bring us with your whole creation to your heavenly kingdom. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, in all honor and glory, of all who dwell on earth and in heaven, for all ages of ages. Amen. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Amen. The cup of blessing which we bless is a sharing in the blood of Christ.
affairs in this sacrament, uniting us with Christ, and giving us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet, prepared for all mankind. Amen. Amen. Just before we sing our departing hymn, the birthday and anniversary, we invite them to come. He's so <laughs> That's free. Oh God, oh God, we thank you for your mercies and for your grace, which is plenteous, which is abundant, which is free, and which is constant. And we thank you, Lord God, for Hazel and for Barbara. We thank you that they know you, that you know them by name and by nature, and that you know everything to be known about them. As a matter of fact, you gave them their names. And you continue to uphold the meaning of their names before them. You created them for a divine purpose to bless you and to be your children in this dark world. You have called them to be ambassadors of your kingdom and representatives of you to men. And so God, we thank you for the ways in which they have seen your grace and your hand at work in their lives. And I pray that as they celebrated, they and continue to celebrate life that you continue to pour out your blessings upon them. That in everything they do, they will prosper. That in every way that they serve you, people will be blessed. I pray, Lord God, that you bless them so that they will be a blessing unto others, beginning with their households. I pray, Lord God, that their children will rise up and call them blessed. I pray, dear Lord, that their grandchildren will find a safe place in their presence. I pray, dear Lord, that they will find a safe space in communion with you. And so whatever they need for this next year of their lives, I pray that you will grant. Whatever plans you have for them for this next year of their lives, I pray that you bring them to that place where they are not anxious, but they are simply trusting every day. And that whatever comes, that they will see your hand at work in everything. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant unto you his peace. Amen. God bless you both. Let us put our hands together for them. Yeah. Just want to remind us of a couple of things. One, we are...